This is a special edition of the Imperial College podcast to mark the First World War centenary. I'm Gareth Mitchell and today we're looking at how the college has marked the occasion and some of the research here that relates to the Great War and the Spanish flu pandemic. Well, first, Hayley Dunning joins me here in our studio in South Kensington. And Hayley, just tell us a bit about your reporting of the commemoration over the last few days and weeks. Yep. So this year, the college had an act of remembrance in the main entrance that was a little bigger than normal to commemorate, obviously, the 100th anniversary of Armistice. So there were laying of wreaths, but also some readings. So we had college chaplain Andrew Wilson, who said something about conflict, both past and present. Today, we gather to remember people killed, injured, and bereaved by military conflict and violence. We particularly remember those members of our college who were killed in the two world wars. And of course, today we're marking the 100th anniversary of the end of the First World War. And we had college archivist Anne Barrett tell us about the people from Imperial's community who went to war and those that didn't come back. Pages of the student magazines are devoted to news of the members of Imperial on active service. The saddest entries are those where the pages are lined in black denoting the deaths of those whose biographies are given. Of the 2,418 past and present college members who served in the forces, 319 died and 393 were wounded. There was also a performance from the college choir of a song of farewell. Words, sounds and music from that special service. So Hayley Dunning, we heard Anne Barrett there and uh, you then went on to speak to her, didn't you? Yeah, I wanted to find out a little bit more about what was going on at the college at the time and also about the people. So I asked her if we have any stories of people from the community who went out to the war. One particular one is by Herbert Klug, Royal Naval Reserve, and he was on a minesweeper for the entire war, actually. Mm. And in the the journal The Phoenix, which is a journal that was for all three constituent colleges, Royal College of Science, Royal School of Mines, City and Guilds College, he has written quite a bit about his interesting cruise to Dunkirk. This was at the time that our warships were shelling the enemy in Belgium. We were then ordered to take seven sweepers to a point abreast of Newport. The German guns on shore opened fire and one of the minesweepers had a narrow escape, a shell passing between its mast and funnel. So this is the sort of thing that they were up against. And he just wrote about it quite very matter-of-factly. And I think this is what happened to most of the people who went out there. This is all there was to keep people in touch with college. And they actually really, really did want to keep in touch because of the camaraderie that they were involved in when they were on their courses although a lot of them were split up and went their different ways it did bring them together being there and they were encouraged to look out for their fellow imperial college colleagues and to also send in any information that they had on them if people weren't writing so as well as students and staff and alumni who went to war i understand our rector at the time sir alfred keogh also went to war can you tell me a bit more about him he was an amazing man, actually. Long before the war, he involved himself in preparing for war. He did this with one of our founders of Imperial College, Lord Haldane. Any improvements that Keogh managed to make to the army, hospitals and medical conditions 
were echoed by Haldane in civilian hospitals, which also meant, of course, that when there was war, civilian hospitals were able to assist much better with the casualties. So he became our rector in 1910 and didn't really expect to have to go back during the war, but he was recalled by Kitchener. First of all, he looked after the hospitals in France, but then he was asked to return to his role as Director General of the Royal Army Medical Corps. One of the things that he had made sure was that all troops would be inoculated against typhoid because that was one of the greatest killers of people when they went abroad. Because of the high esteem that Keogh was held in, the students decided that they wanted to give a gift that would assist in his work in the army, once recalled. And so for about £200, they managed to buy a portable x-ray machine, Mm. which was very useful at the front, and it immediately was shipped out to France. So that says a huge amount about how people felt about Keogh. And even during the war, he kept in touch. He would write to the magazine's esteem. And when he came back, it it was a time of absolute joy, actually. This is how it is reported in the Central magazine. And so as well as advances out in the field, what was going on at Imperial at the time? Did we do any war research? We did a huge amount of research at Imperial. We worked on pharmaceuticals and quite a lot of chemistry analysis of poison gases, cold storage for foods, insecticides. There was a lot of work on optics because one of our big problems was that, of course, op- many optics came from Germany, which was a, then cut off from us. And the technical optics course was established in 1917. This was the first one in the country. And that it was actually established in the war is quite a, a feat as well. And the first professor of optical design was Alexander Eugen Conradi, who had been a a refugee in previous conflicts. Mining geology took oil testing for the Air Ministry. Physics was involved in X-ray machine fuels and engines. And botany worked on food science. Large-scale field experiments on wheat, plant pathology and tropical hygiene. Biochemistry department investigated adhesives for aircraft, because remember they were wood and starch fabric at one time. J.T. Irwin from Electrical Engineering developed a giant parabolic reflector at Dover used as an early aircraft detection device. Morley Davis from Geology created a one millionth map of Europe. And Percy Boswell worked on glass sands with the Ministry of Munitions. Alumni contributed to Herta Ayrton devised a gas fan for use against gas attacks on the trenches. William Watson, later Professor of Physics, was Lieutenant Colonel Director of Central Laboratory of Western Front and he died from exposure to poisonous gas from the gas shells he examined. And he was quite a hero. Those stories from Anne Barrett, who has been talking to Hayley Dunning. Now, also here is Caroline Brogan. And I wonder if we can move the story on here, Caroline, and talk about imperial research relating to blast injury. That's a big research area here. And many parallels between the modern day and the First World War. So you've met a couple of experts here, haven't you? I have. I've met a young British army veteran who lost his legs from a blast injury in Afghanistan a few years ago. He's currently here doing a PhD looking at how to improve the treatment for amputees and how to improve prosthetics. But first I caught up with Dr Emily Mayhew from our Centre for Blast Injury Studies. Emily is a military medical historian and has studied World War I extensively. Blast injury was the most common injury on the Western Front for the duration of the whole of the First World War. Between 65 and 70 percent of all the injuries that came in to be treated by medics were blast injuries and they were caused by artillery, so big shells fired from really big guns. The point about blast injury is it needs to be treated very, very quickly. Because it's mainly about blowing big holes in people, people lose a lot of blood. And unless you can stop them bleeding out, unless you can control their hemorrhage, there's pretty much no point trying to get to them in the first place. Trained stretcher bearers were sent out to the point of wounding. They didn't wait until people were brought back in to start treating them. They were trained to control hemorrhage and they were sent out just behind the soldiers and they stopped where people fell and they started to treat them then and then. You can make a very good case to say that it's affected all of us. This idea of treatment at point of wounding, the idea of of taking 
medical capability to the point of wounding or, or the point of injury. That's something we accept as being so fundamental now. Anyone who's seen a paramedic treat a road traffic accident at the roadside, that principle of the treatment at point of wounding and a medicalised journey to the hospital, that comes from the First World War. The case was made for that in the First World War and it's something that we simply never forgot. Right, so we can trace today's paramedics and their practice back to the Western Front. That's definitely something I've learned from that section of your interview, Caroline. What about pain relief? Because that came up in your conversation as well, didn't it? It did. So obviously the most effective pain relief, you think morphine, which was used in World War One, but unfortunately Germany were actually our suppliers of the drug. So eventually we ran out and this forced the Allies to come up with more innovative solutions to the pain that was experienced on the battlefield. The standard pain treatment allocated within the British military and indeed within British medicine at that period was morphine and pharmaceuticals, the majority of which is imported from Germany, uh, along incidentally with x-ray films. So two of the most fundamental medical supplies that you need for this kind of traumatic injury are not available to the British Army, to the British medical system, because we've gone to war with the people we import these supplies from. So very quickly, Britain has to learn how to make its own x-ray films and really importantly, how to synthesise its own morphine. And it does this astonishingly quickly. Within a year, we have enough morphine for the remainder of the war. Germany will run out, but we will have enough. And it's one of those unknown stories of the war. That's Emily Mayhew. So tell us a bit more about the amputee. This is the young British veteran who was injured in Afghanistan. Yes, Dave Henson is doing a PhD here in amputee biomechanics. He's trying to make prosthetics more comfortable for people to wear and to help the prosthetics work better with the body. And a bit like Emily, in Dave's own research, he's making quite a lot of comparisons between what goes on on the battlefield and in medicine now as compared to in the First World War, isn't he? Yes, of course, more people survive their injuries now. So our knowledge of how to keep stumps healthy and how to deal with amputation injuries continues to improve. Yeah, and that whole field is really moving on. And also, as Dave told you, there have been some real developments based on those crucial minutes and seconds after an injury. So from point of wounding, the army's brought in something called the platinum 10 minutes, which is the first 10 minutes from point of injury onwards. It's all about stabilising the patient and minimising any loss of blood. And this is something that's taught to every single soldier on the ground and it's expected to be delivered by your common garden soldier, as it were. So this is not by any specifically trained medical personnel, it's by the soldiers on the ground as part of their battlefield first aid package. And then you look into the golden hour, which is all about maximising efforts to get the service man or woman to a higher level medical facility within that hour. And within that hour, you're then looking at providing them with the life-saving surgery and making sure that the efforts of the fellow soldiers on the ground are essentially not wasted, but are also made more permanent. Now, another thing that came up in your conversation with Dave is just the extraordinary progress we've seen, especially in recent years, in these prosthetic limbs. I mean, they are sophisticated pieces of technology in their own right, aren't they? Yeah, so Dave's legs are built to sort of cushion the impact of walking climbing up and down stairs and inside the leg are processors and sensors like accelerometers to do this so new developments within prosthetic limb technology are in power generation and control of the limb control specifically is looking at ways in which you can link much more intuitively your own central nervous system your body system into the prosthetic so you're actually providing some sort of feed forward controller into the limb rather than relying uh, on an algorithm and a feedback process from the limb to yourselves so a lot of the efforts are being placed into things like electromyography or emg sensors where they'll have these sensors placed over the muscles and can then sort of predict what you're trying to do with those muscles and feed that into the limb And the other efforts, I I guess, have been focused on the power generation. So this is looking at ways in which you can take a prosthesis and instead of it being a passive prosthesis, turning it into an active prosthesis. So most of the prosthetics on the market at the minute will rely on on muscle power alone for movement, requiring a a lot larger effort from uh, the subject's residual limbs. Whereas if you use an active prosthetic, it's got its own motor or or hydraulic system in there which provides um, a net positive power generation either at the ankle or the knee joint to contribute to movement to reduce the burden to the user. So I think these are the two areas where you really see advancements in prosthetics themselves. 
Right, so power generation and control mechanisms. This is such a high-tech field. But uh, Dave's interests more widely, I suppose, go beyond just the technology behind these new 21st century prosthetic limbs, don't they, Caroline? Yeah, so Dave's looking at treating amputation as a condition in itself so that you treat the whole person rather than just tweaking the prosthetic itself. He believes this approach will make things better in general for amputees and for blast injury survivors. You can look at the physio side of things and the rehabilitation programme which an amputee has been on in order to improve strength and endurance so that they can go off and do more. You can improve the way that clinical prosthetics are delivered to make sure that the comfort and longevity of the amputee stumps are as best they can be. You can improve the engineering design of the prosthetic components as we've already spoken about but you can also treat the condition of amputation using surgical methods as well. So there's an awful lot of effort across the globe into things like organ and limb regeneration at the minute and I I see that having the most significant impact on amputees in general so if you can take those kind of technologies and and either use them to recreate a joint or a limb or regenerate a joint or a limb I see that as being you know the, the most perfect solution and you know if you can take away the requirement for prosthetics, then actually I think the the problem is therefore solved. So that's Dave Henson. Finally then, Caroline, let's go back to your conversation with Emily Mayhew because it really strikes me how much the First World War contributed to medicine now. Absolutely. If a surgeon from the First World War were to jump in a time machine and join us today, they'd see quite a few parallels in what they're used to. Emily shared with me a really interesting story highlighting just this. I read a wonderful article in The Lancet that's written at the end of 1916 by an orthopaedic doctor who's based down at Roehampton. He was addressing the issue of once the patient is up on their new prosthetic leg in particular, how to ensure that they could see how to walk on it, how to make sure that they were keeping their balance, how to see how their their new body shape was. And so he writes in and says, I think this is a useful tip. You should go to your local dance college and borrow two dancing bars from the ballet department and set them up in the gymnasium. And then I borrowed a mirror from my wife. I took the mirror from her wardrobe and I set it up at the end of these two bars. And then the patients can walk along the bars using them for balance and they can look in the mirror and see how they're walking see how their body is working with their new limb. And this would be a very useful thing for other people to do. Well, of course, what he's described is the design of every rehab and prosthetics lab since then. Two bars borrowed from a dance college and his wife's wardrobe mirror. Things start very simple, but they are very important, and we shouldn't forget that. That's Emily Mayhew, who was talking there to Caroline Brogan. Well, the year 1918 is also known for the Spanish flu pandemic. Professor Wendy Barclay of our Faculty of Medicine is an expert on that subject, and Ryan O'Hare has been speaking to her. So this month is 100 years since the armistice, which marks the end of the First World War, but it's also the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu pandemic. So why was this outbreak of influenza in particular so bad? Yeah, so that's a million dollar question. Um, which probably doesn't have one straightforward answer. Uh, Just to put it in perspective, we think that the case fatality rate in uh, 1918 was about 2%, and the last pandemic that the world experienced in 2009 from the swine flu was about 0.02%, so about 100-fold less deadly, if you like. As a virologist, uh, one of my key explanations is that the virus itself was a special and deadly virus, In recent times, we've had the capability to uh, bring that virus back to life by piecing together the fragments of genetic sequence from lungs of soldiers who died of 1918 flu and then using a, a technique called reverse genetics to be able to bring the virus back and study it. Then if you put that regenerated virus into animal models, it is more deadly than any of the current seasonal flu viruses that, that we work with, or indeed than swine flu. It's very, very lethal at very low doses. It's also highly transmissible. So it's clear that the virus all by itself was um, a particularly nasty strain of virus. Um, but there are other theories which probably are also true. The last pandemic before 1918 was in 1889. And this introduced an H3 virus into the world, 
the 1918 virus was an H1. And the current popular theory is that your first flu that you see as a child sets your immune system up to respond well to, to viruses related to that flu and less well to all the others. So for many, many reasons, the young people in their 20s were in a bad place when 1918 hit. They were not immunologically prepared for this virus. If anything, they were immunosuppressed. And the virus itself was a particularly deadly strain. So they never really had a chance, basically? They did not have a chance. But let's remember, 2% died, 98% survived. So it still is, you know, the tip of the iceberg, but but 2% uh, mortality rate is something that we don't want to be thinking about today. And obviously today we have um, things like antivirals and uh, vaccines and antibiotics to to combat the majority of these things. Um, What was available then at the time? (laughs) Absolutely nothing. No antibiotics, no vaccines... Uh, and certainly no antivirals. People didn't even know this was a virus. Um, Viruses had only recently been sort of comprehended, and influenza virus certainly wasn't found, if you like, until the 1930s. You know, there are various public health uh, films that one can see where gargling with various, you know, salty waters, etc., are recommended. Um, Vaccines, there were none. People were just beginning to understand uh, the concept, perhaps, of passive immunity here and there were some um, I think there were some attempts of taking blood from people who had survived and seeing if it could be transferred to um, victims to to save them Uh, and uh, I mean you can imagine trying to perform such an experiment in an army hospital on the western front or something I mean I think that, that it's a mixed success. I mean, aspirin was also talked about quite a lot and trialled by various army doctors, but the doses that were being given there were huge and probably did, again, more harm than good. Quite a simple question, but I I think it's one question that quite a few of us will ask, is why is it called the Spanish flu? I mean, did it originate in Spain or was the Spanish population hit harder? No, this is all down to the First World War censorship. Um, So all countries in the world were experiencing the the flu virus by the second wave, which was November 1918. Um, But prior to that, uh, nobody was allowed to report it. Um, Spain was neutral in the First World War, and so they could report it. And when the king of Spain acquired the infection, um, he didn't die from it, but he certainly was ill, it was reported in the Spanish newspapers and therefore has ever after been known as Spanish flu. It's quite a simple um, origin story. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And um, the virus itself, how does it differ, or how did it differ, rather, from um, the types of influenzas that we see today? And uh, Were there any specific uh, biological or genetic factors that made it so deadly? So a lot of people have been asking whether there's one single gene of the virus which makes it more deadly than the sorts of viruses that we see today. And the simple answer is no, there isn't. But it looks like 1918 flu was a fairly recently acquired virus from birds. We don't really have any evidence at the moment that it went through pigs, but from the sequence which was pieced together, the virus looks pretty much like an avian virus which just crossed straight from birds into humans rather than going through an intermediate. And what seems to happen there is is, um, that you end up with a virus which doesn't really match very well with the inside of a human cell and it makes a number of mistakes. And those mistakes are picked up on by our cells and trigger what's known as the cytokine storm. And this cytokine storm is typical of what we see today with individuals in Southeast Asia who've been exposed and infected by the bird flus like H5N1 and H7N9. And those, remember, carry these very high case fatality rates, I mean 60% for H5N1. Uh, And those people who who are succumbing to that virus are full of cytokines and they're undergoing this sort of hemorrhaging, uh, which is a hallmark of endothelial leakage and cytokine storm. Now, we know from the reports at the time that the the doctors were making in the army camps that one of the symptoms that was associated with 1918 flu was this um, heliotrope cyanosis, so basically the collapsing of the lungs, uh, but also the coughing up of blood, And that's very indicative, I think, of a cytokine storm-like scenario. Um, So, yeah, combined together, there are sort of at least half of the genome of the 1918 flu virus looks like it was a combination 
rather similar to the H5N1s and the H7N9s that we see today, which are bird flus which have just about hopped into humans. I guess one of the most important questions I, I think around this is, could an outbreak of this scale happen again and, and what would it take to stop it? Yeah, so I think all influenza virologists and many public health planners are agreed there will be another influenza pandemic. Um, 2009 was on a huge scale, it was a full-blown pandemic, um, but luckily the case fatality associated with the virus and with the times was less. So there will be another pandemic, uh, it will be on the same scale because we have you know, international travel, we, we have people living in cities with the capability of transmission for airborne viruses being very high. Uh, I don't think that it will carry quite such a high case fatality rate when the next pandemic strikes, but all of that will depend on the route by which the virus reaches us. Uh, does it come through pigs or does it come directly from birds? And what, therefore, is the genetic nature of the virus? So that's the major player today over which we have relatively little control. And therefore, I think it's, what we have to do is plan for the worst case scenario. And probably the worst, worst case scenario is that an avian virus directly jumps into humans and acquires the minimal uh, mutations to infect humans and transmit amongst us, rather like the 1918 virus did. Um, what, you know, what we have to do then is to check that we understand what's going on in people infected with such viruses so that we can think about the very best therapies and use of what we do have. Wendy Barclay talking there to Ryan O'Hare, bringing to an end this special commemorative edition of the Imperial College podcast. Thanks very much to the team, Hayley Dunning, Caroline Brogan and Ryan O'Hare. I'm Gareth Mitchell and we'll be back with more next month. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>